Good evening, everyone. Ne, recim ti dobro večer. Dobro večer svim prijateljima, oni koji me sada ne razumiju, kojih i tako dalje. So the translation, uh, good evening uh, to all our but comrades. But please, complete translation. Yeah, yeah, please, yeah. So, good evening to everyone, to all my comrades who don't understand me, fuck them. Yeah, Is it a correct translation? More or less, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what can I say? Uh, welcome to the 6th Subversive Festival, and thanks for being with us for six years. Thanks for everyone in this hall for being with us, or to the new people, thanks again. Uh, there is no need to present Slavo into detail, uh, but I should mention that just two books were published uh, during his visit to Croatia again. Uh, the first one is published by Meander, it's Gledanje uh, iz Kosa. And the second one is The Year of Dreaming Dangerously, published by Fraktura. Uh, but the topic of today's lecture is, I think, for all of you, much more interesting. It's called Love as a Political Category. I remember when I was trying to convince Slavo in Ljubljana to take this topic, he was first, no, 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 what can I say about love? And then in the end, I got a mail a few weeks later, and he said, okay, I will do this lecture. So, let's see. A big applause for Slavo. Oh I hope you will not be disappointed because this time I will not do with any political interventions. It will really be about the concept of love, how can it be used politically. First, a quote. If all else perished and he remained, I should still continue to be. And if all else remained and he were annihilated, the universe would turn to a mighty stranger. I should not seem a part of it." End of quote. This is how, in Emily Brontë's Withering Hates, Katie characterizes her relation to Heathcliff and provides a succinct definition of the unconditional erotic love. There is an unmistakable dimension of terror at work here. Think about the ecstatic trance of Tristan and Isolde, ready to obliterate the entire social reality in their immersion into the night of deadly enjoyment. Now, I could go on here about erotic love because I sincerely think that in contrast to our youth, the youth of those who are already old here, when you know, to fight for sexual freedom was experienced as liberating and even monogamous love was considered or dismissed as a bourgeois convention and so on. I think that today more and more love, simply passionate love, is emerging as something dangerous and precisely subversing. Think about how you are addressed in your everyday life by society, what society demands of you. It's basically a kind of slightly spiritual pseudo-Buddhist hedonism. Ideology is telling you, uh, uh, be faithful to yourself, realize your true potentials, uh, uh, and experiment with your life, try all different options, don't fixate yourself on a certain uh, stable identities, life is dynamic, fluid, and so on and so on. And I claim within this economy, not only is stable love, passionate love, emerging as an obstacle to your authentic development, but uh, even the crucial dimension of love is gradually disappearing. Uh, what is love? As Alain Badiou, our good friend, who wasn't able to come here, put it in his wonderful book, In Praise of Love. Uh, there is always something traumatic, extremely violent in love. Love is a permanent emergency state. You fall in love, 
And it's crucial that in English and in French, we use this expression, to fall in love. You lose control. <coughs> it's really, I claim that love, the experience of passionate love, is the most elementary metaphysical experience. It's a platonic experience. In the sense of you lead your easy daily life, you meet friends, you go to parties, whatever, everything is normal, maybe here and there a wine night stand, but whatever. And then you passionately fall in love. Everything is ruined. The entire balance of your life is lost. Everything is subordinated to this one person. I almost cannot imagine in normal daily life, outside war and so on, a more violent experience than that of love. And I think, which is why all the advisors that we need today uh, are trying precisely to domesticate or to erase this excess of love. It's as if love is too poisonous and then they tell you, you know, the, the trick that they try to offer you, all the marriage agencies, dating agencies, is how to find yourself in love without falling in love. This idea came to me when on one of the transatlantic flights I was in a, I read one of those stupid uh, uh, airline journals and there was a big text there claiming uh, a publicity text claiming we will enable you to be in, to find yourself in love without the fall, without this dangerous exposure. And I think this fits perfectly our daily narcissistic metaphysics. You know the old story that I repeat all the time. We want coffee without caffeine, we want beer without alcohol, and we want love without its dangerous moment where you get lost. But okay, enough of this. Uh, now this is eros, erotic love. Then we have its counterpoint in Christianity, agape. Agape functions in a wholly different way. How? It may appear that in contrast to eros, with its violent subtraction from the collective space, the love for a collective succeeds in getting rid of the excess of terrorizing violence. Thus, agape not imply an emphatic yes to the beloved collective, ultimately to the entire humanity, or even, as in Buddhism, to the entire domain of suffering life. The first counter-argument is provided here by the reply to a simple question. Just think about it. Which political regimes in the 20th century legitimized their power by evoking the subject's love for their leader? It was the so-called, I don't like the term, totalitarian ones. Today, remember, it is only and precisely North Korean regime which evokes all the time the infinite love of the Korean people for Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, and so on, and vice versa, the radiating love of the leader for his people, love expressed in continuous acts of grace. Kim Jong-il wrote a short poem along these lines. I will quote you the entire poem, just two lines. In the same way that a sunflower can only thrive if it is turned towards the sun, the Korean people can only thrive if their eyes are turned upwards towards their leader, towards himself, of course. Terror and mercy are thus closely linked. They are effectively the front and the obverse of the same power structure. Only a power which asserts its full terrorist right or capacity to destroy anything and anyone it wants, only such a power can systematically uh, universalize mercy. Since this power could have destroyed everyone, those who survive are all still alive because of the mercy of those in power. Consequently, the very fact that we the subjects of power are alive is the proof of the power's infinite mercy. This is why the more a regime is terrorist, the more its leaders are praised for their infinite love, goodness, and mercy. Theodor Adorno was right to emphasize that in politics, 
Love is evoked precisely when another democratic legitimization is lacking. Loving a leader means you love him for what he is, not for what he does. Okay, we may agree with this. So how about the next candidate for love as a political category? The so-called oriental spirituality, Buddhism, with its, or so we are told, more gentle, balanced, holistic, ecological approach. You know, all the stories about how, say, when digging up earth for the foundation of a house, Tibetan Buddhists are careful not to kill any worms and so on. In the whole of the last 150 years, Japan's rapid industrialization and militarization with the ethics of discipline and sacrifice was sustained by the large majority of Zen Buddhist thinkers. Who today knows that Daizet Steitaro Suzuki himself, the high guru of Zen in the United States of the 1960s, supported in his youth in Japan of the 1930s, the spirit of utter discipline and militaristic expansion. There is no contradiction here, no manipulative perversion of some authentic, compassionate insight. The attitude of total immersion into the selfless now of the instant, the so-called Buddhist enlightenment in which all reflexive distance is lost, in short, in which absolute discipline coincides with total spontaneity, perfectly legitimizes our subordination to the militaristic social machine. It's quite interesting to read this, to read Buddhist texts on uh, war, where they claim that openly for ordinary people who don't have time to meditate for years, the best shortcut towards overcoming your false self and reaching nirvana, satori, however we call it, is total subordination to the military discipline. And Suzuki himself wrote a wonderful text where he even gives the advice to the military into how using Buddhism to make killing easier. He says, if I persist in my everyday attitude of false belief that I have a self which is the free agent of its acts, then let us say I have to kill one of you. Then this is difficult because you are here, I see it, I look into your eyes, I find it difficult, should I stab the, night, the knife into you, I feel responsible. Then Suzuki says, but if you reach Buddhist enlightenment, the thing gets much easier. You no longer believe in your autonomous self. You perceive yourself as just a void, an anonymous, impassive observer of life around you where phenomena simply are engaged in their cosmic dance, which is a totally neutral process. And from this distance, as Suzuki puts it, you simply observe your knife in a cosmic dance of phenomena hitting the eye or the throat of your enemy and so on. Now, this is no joking matter because I'm not blaming Buddhism for this. I'm just saying how even the most radical spirituality is no guarantee that we will not be doing horrible things in our daily life. So again, what this means is that the Buddhist all-encompassing compassion has to be opposed to the Christian intolerant, violent love. I want to praise the Christian love. Uh, although Christians would probably lynch me for, for what I will say now. The Buddhist stance is that of indifference, of quenching all passions which strive to establish differences. While the Christian love is a violent passion to introduce difference, a gap in the order of being, to privilege and elevate some object at the expense of others. Love is violence, not in the vulgar sense of the well-known Balkan proverb, if he doesn't beat me, he doesn't love me. Violence is already the love choice as such, which tears its object out of its context, elevating it to the sublime absolute thing. 
in Montenegro folklore, so I was told by Andrei Nikolaidis, my Montenegro friend, the origin of evil is a beautiful woman. She makes men around her lose their balance. She literally destabilizes the universe, colors all things with a tone of partiality. Among Christian theologists, it was Gilbert Keith Chesterton who fully assumed the consequences of this violent aspect of love. One has to get rid of the old platonic topos of love as eros, which gradually elevates itself from love for a particular individual through the love for the beauty of a human body in general, and then the love of the beautiful form as such, to finally the love for the supreme good beyond all forms. True love is precisely the opposite move of forsaking the promise of eternity itself for an imperfect individual. What if the gesture of choosing temporal existence, of giving up eternal existence for the sake of love, from Jesus Christ to, for example, Sigmund in the act two of Richard Wagner's Die Valkyrie, who, Sigmund, prefers to stay, to remain a common mortal, if his beloved Sieglinde, Sieglinde cannot follow him to Valhalla, the eternal dwelling of the dead heroes. What if this is the highest ethical act of them all? I think this is the message of Christianity which is still alive. Not forsake all terrestrial things for eternity, but love means I know you are a miserable mortal being, but I'm ready to forsake eternity itself for you. Uh, based on this insight, Chesterton rejected the fashionable claim about the alleged spiritual identity of Buddhism and Christianity. Here is a well-known, I want to repeat it, quote from Chesterton, from his orthodoxy, quote, Love desires personality, therefore love desires division. It is the instinct of Christianity to be glad that God has broken the universe into little pieces. This is the intellectual abyss between Buddhism and Christianity. That for the Buddhist, personality is the fall of man. For the Christian, it is the purpose of God, the whole point of his cosmic idea. The world soul of the theosophists or Buddhists, asks men to love it only in order that man may throw himself into it. But the divine center of Christianity actually threw man out of it in order that we might love it. All modern philosophies are chains which connect and fetter. Christianity is a sword which separates and sets free. No other philosophy makes God actually rejoice in the separation of the universe into different living souls." End of quote. A tremendous violence thus dwells in, the very, dwells in the very heart of the Christian notion of love for one's neighbor. The violence which finds its most direct expression in a series of Christ's disturbing statements. Here are some of these passages from Gospels. Just listen to them. You may be surprised what you find in Gospels. Christ saying, talking all the time. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and men's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Next quote. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Next quote, the best one, I think. Perhaps people think that I have come to cast peace upon the world. They do not know that I have come to cast conflicts upon the earth. Fire, sword, war. For there will be fire in a house. There will be three against two and two against three. Father against son, son against father, 
and they will stand alone. The final quote. So how are we to read these statements? And believe me, I know what I'm talking about. I'm asking all the time when I engage in debates with Catholic or Protestant or Orthodox priests, I'm asking them, okay, just tell me what this means. And it's incredible how they try to squeeze out, you know. One way is the, uh, how should I call it, the linguistic one. They claim, no, maybe hate is not the right translation. That Christ just wanted to say, if you love some other people more than me, not to hate them. I claim this is a blasphemy for a true Christian. Christ, God appears here then as a stupid, jealous guy, you know. You can love others, but be sure that you love me more. That's an obscenity. Or, <coughs> uh, the best answer was given to me by a Polish priest in Warsaw during a debate. When I asked him, what does this mean? And he told me, oh my God, I didn't expect this question today. I would need more time to prepare the answer. To which I answered him, fuck you, you had 2,000 years to prepare the answer, you know. I didn't pull out an unknown passage. And it's, again, absolutely incredible how they are really not ready to provide a clear answer. What do these lines mean? To put it in a somewhat simplified, simplified way, there are two basic attitudes discernible in the history of religions. On the one hand, there is the pagan cosmos, the divine hierarchical order of cosmic principles, which, when copied onto society, gives the image of a congruent edifice, edifice in which each member is at its own place. The supreme good is here, the global balance of principles, and evil stands for their derailment or derangement, for the excessive assertion of one principle to the detriment of others, of the masculine to the detriment of the feminine, of reason to the detriment of feeling, and so on. The cosmic balance is then re-established through the work of justice, which, with inexorable necessity, sets things straight again by crushing the derailed element. With regard to the social body, an individual is good when he or she acts in accordance with his special place within the social edifice, when he respects nature, which provides food and shelter, when he shows respect for his superiors, when he takes care of his uh, 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 followers or children in a fatherly way, and so on and so on. And evil is defined as uh, Evil occurs when some particular strata or individuals are no longer satisfied with their proper place. Children no longer obey parents, servants no longer obey masters, rulers no longer take care of their subjects, and so on and so on. Uh, I think that this is the ethics which even now is re-emerging often in the guise of some New Age wisdom. It's called so-called holistic approach, you know. Every element should remain at its proper place, evil is imbalance, and so on and so on. I claim that Christianity does precisely the opposite. Christianity introduces into the global balanced order a principle totally foreign to it, a principle that, measured by the standards of, the traditional, of a traditional cosmology, cannot but appear as a monstrous distortion. The principle according to which each individual has an immediate access to the universality. In Christianity, the universality of the Holy Spirit, or today, the universality of human rights, freedoms, and so on. I can participate in this universal dimension directly, irrespective of my special place within the global social order. So do Christ's scandalous words, which I quoted, not point in the same direction? Here, of course, we are not dealing with a simple, brutal hatred demanded by a cruel and jealous God. When Christ says, if you don't hate your father and mother, you cannot be my follower, I think the point is not that you should simply hate them as living beings. I think that it's very sim in a very simple way you can resolve this dilemma. Father, mother, and so on, here stand or uh, 
condense the entire hierarchic social order, the network of relations of domination, subordination, and so on. So that the hatred Christ mentions is simply the hatred of established social hierarchy. You are my follower if, instead of functioning as a part of social hierarchic order, you see as your true home, as it were, Holy Spirit, an unconditionally egalitarian community. Uh, or, as St. Paul put it, it is love that enjoins us to unplug from our social community into which we were born so that, you know the passage, there are neither men nor women, neither Jews nor Greeks. This is, I think, the very, I'm simplifying it, of course, but nonetheless, the very core of the Christian insight for me. God dies. Christ dies. At the same time, the Father dies. All that survives is Holy Spirit, which is the first name of the Communist Party, as we know. A radically egalitarian society which violently opposes social hierarchy, an immediate violent assertion of uh, universal equality. And it is against this Christian background that we should read Che Guevara's well-known statement on revolutionary love, a quote from Che Guevara. At the risk of seeming ridiculous, let me say that the true revolutionary is guided by great feelings of love. It is impossible to think of a genuine revolutionary lacking this quality. End of quote. There is a further step to be made here. Guevara's statement that the true revolutionary is guided by a great feeling of love should be read together with his more problematic statement on revolutionaries as killing machines. Now comes the other statement. Hatred is an element of struggle, relentless hatred of the enemy that impels us over and beyond the natural limitations of men and transforms us into effective, violent, selective, and cold killing machines. That's the other quote. These two apparently opposite stances are united in Che Guevara's well-known motto. One must endure, become hard, toughen oneself without losing tenderness, end of quote. I think Guevara is here basically paraphrasing Christ's declaration of the unity of love and sword. In both cases, the underlying paradox is that what makes love angelic, what elevates it over mere unstable, pathetic sentimentality is its cruelty itself, its link with violence. So while Guevara certainly believed in the transformative power of love, he would never have been caught humming all you need is love. What you need is to love with hatred. Or another strange bedfellow here. As Seren Kierkegaard put it long ago, the necessary consequence, the truth of the Christian demand to love one's enemy is, quote from Kierkegaard, is the demand to hate the beloved out of love and in love. So high, humanly speaking, to a kind of madness, can Christianity press the demand of love if love is to be the fulfillment of the law. Therefore, it teaches that the Christian shall, if it is demanded, be capable of hating his father and mother and sister and beloved. End of quote. With regard to social order, this means that the authentic Christian tradition rejects the wisdom that the hierarchic order is our fate, that all attempts to mess with it and to create another egalitarian order have to end up in destructive horror. Agape is political love, and following Terry Eagleton, this is how I would propose to translate agape, is simply political love. Agape means that the unconditional egalitarian love for the new, for the neighbor, can serve as the foundation for a new social order. The form of appearance of this love is the so-called apocalyptic millenarism or the idea of communism, the urge to realize an egalitarian social order of solidarity. 
Love is the force of this universal link which, in an emancipatory collective, connects people directly in their singularity, bypassing their particular hierarchic determinations. Terror is terror out of love for the universal singular others against the particular. This terror names exactly the same as the work of love. So my reproach to the fundamentalist terrorists, Islamist or Christian, should be that precisely they are not terrorists in the right way, that they shirk from authentic terror of the work of love. Now you will say, be saying, am I crazy? What distinguishes this from a murderous terrorist who kills but claiming I'm killing you because of your eternal soul and so on and so on? I will try to explain this in the remaining part by beginning with what is precisely the form of non-love today which poses as love, charity. One, again, of the names and practices of non-love today. When we see an ad with starving children in Africa with a call to do something to help them, like something like for the price of a couple of cappuccinos you can save their life and so on, I claim that the true message is something like don't think, don't politicize, forget about the true causes of their poverty. Just act, contribute money so that you will not have to think. In short, the true message is for the price of a couple of cappuccinos, you can continue your ignorant, pleasurable life, not only not feeling any guilt, but even feeling good for participating in the struggle against suffering. So, how would this notion of love, which is the opposite of charity, charity is false love, because charity is love with the true aim of which is to make you feel good. My God, what a great man. I am, you see, I'm helping all the children starving in Somalia and so on and so on. How would the authentic violent love help us to orient ourselves today? Let me begin with a wonderful quote from last Christmas issue of the magazine Spectator. The, in this issue, there is an editorial entitled Why 2012 was the best year ever. This editorial argues against the perception that we live in a dangerous, cruel world where things are bad and getting worse. Here is the first paragraph of this uh, uh, editorial. I quote, it may not feel like it, but 2012 has been the greatest year in the history of the world. That sounds like an extravagant claim, but it is borne out by evidence. Never has there been less hunger, less disease, or more prosperity. The West remains in the economic doldrums, but most developing countries are charging ahead, and people are being lifted out of poverty at the fastest rate ever recorded. The death toll inflicted by war and natural disasters is also mercifully low. We are living in a golden age." End of quote. Now, the first thing to add here, even if I, why not, I always like to concede to the devil what belongs to the devil, even many things are true in this statement, but the first thing to add is that people rebel not when things are really bad, but when their expectations are disappointed. French Revolution took place after the king and the nobles were for decades gradually losing their full hold on power. The 1956 anti-communist revolt in Hungary exploded after Imre Nagy, the reformist prime minister later shot by the Soviets, was already prime minister for two years. And after relatively free debates among intellectuals were allowed. Even a closer example, people rebelled in Egypt in 2011 because there was some minimal economic progress under Mubarak given rise to a whole class of educated young people who participated in the universal digital culture. And this is why the Chinese communists are right to be in panic, precisely because on average, Chinese are now living considerably better than 40 years ago. But the social antagonisms between the newly rich and the rest exploded, plus expectations are much higher. That's the problem with development and progress. They are always uneven, 
They give birth to new instabilities and antagonisms. They generate new expectations which cannot be met. In Tunisia or Egypt, just prior to the Arab Spring, the majority probably lived a little bit better than decades ago. But the standard by which they measured their insatisfaction was much higher. So, yes, the spectator is in principle right, claiming that we live in a golden era. But the very facts that spectator emphasizes are creating conditions for revolt and rebellion. So again, what rebellion? There is a more downward version of this claim of spectator, which I often hear in mass media, especially when I visit non-European countries. They laugh at me and they say, crisis, what crisis are you talking about? Look at the BRIC countries, Poland, South Korea, Singapore, Peru, even many sub-Saharan African states. They are all progressing. The losers are only West Europe and up to a point the United States. So we are not dealing with a global crisis, but just with the shift of the dynamics of progress away from the West. Is a portent symbol of this shift, not the fact that recently many people from Portugal, a country in deep crisis, are returning to Mozambique and Angola, ex-colonies of Portugal, but this time as economic immigrants, not as colonizers. So what if our much decried crisis is a mere local crisis in an overall progress? Even with regard to human rights, is the situation in China and Russia now not much better than 50 years ago? Decrying the ongoing crisis as a global phenomenon is thus a typical Eurocentrist view. And the view coming from leftists who are usually pride, who usually pride themselves on their anti-Eurocentrism. This, there is a partial truth in it. And again, admit what is true. It's true that globally, economy is progressing. I mean, the crisis in some sense is not global. But nonetheless, I think we should restrain here our anti-colonialist joy a little bit. The question to be raised is, if Europe is in gradual decay, what is replacing its hegemon? Capitalism with Asian values, which of course has nothing to do with Asian people and everything with the clear and present tendency of contemporary capitalism. As such, everywhere, to suspend or at least limit, constrain democracy. From Marx on, the truly radical left was never simply progressist. It was always obsessed by the question, what is the hidden price of progress? Marx was fascinated by capitalism, by the unheard of productivity it unleashed. He just insisted that this very success engenders antagonisms. And we should do the same with today's progress of global capitalism. Keep in view its dark underside. How? Where? First, I want to note something about the status of universality, because critiques of universality sorry, critiques of Eurocentrism usually emphasize the ideological limitation, lie, deception of Western European universalism, claiming that, for example, and they are right up to a point, when we talk about human rights, we privilege a certain ideological set of human rights specific of Western individualist societies and so on and so on. That's true, but the situation is a little bit more complicated because uh, in a properly dialectical Marxist perspective, yes, every universality can, can be false. It is always overdetermined by some particular content. For example, human rights, yes, but if you look closely at it, human rights secretly privilege white, male, people of some property, and so on and so on. So whenever we it's clear that this is in some sense true. For example, when we talk about Chinese philosophy, it's clear that we are doing a Eurocentrist operation because philosophy as we know it emerged in Europe. And if we apply the same notion to Chinese thought, the Chinese thought is automatically in a disadvantage and so on and so on. But this historicist relativism 
beware how universality can be a false universality, is just one side of the story. Marx is saying something, I think, which is uh, much more actual today. That we are not only less universal than we think. We think universal human rights, we privilege European, patriarchal, whatever rights. We are also much more universal, much more universal than we think we are. For Marx, the uniqueness of capitalism is that as agents on a market, we ourselves as individuals occupy a universal position in the sense that uh, we relate to ourselves as universal subjects, universal in the sense that we are no longer fully rooted in or identified with the particular social, ideological, and so on positions. It's not a universality with regard to others. It's I relate to myself as someone who, for example, today I'm an engineer, I lose this work tomorrow, I can be a taxi driver, then I don't know what. Our particular field of work is experienced as something ultimately contingent. The same goes for market commodities and so on. So universality is a way of life, as it were. It's a mode of our immediate experience. And now the big question is what role with regard to the process of emancipation, this brutal late capitalist universality, this unheard of force of capitalism to dissolve our particular modes of life and so on has. I want now to do something extremely problematic. I want to rehabilitate a text of Marx, rather two texts, which are usually dismissed by post-colonial studies as embarrassing cases of Marxist racism and Eurocentrism. He's too short from 1853 articles or on India. The British rule in India and the future results of British rule in India. Marx admits here without restraint the brutality and exploitative hypocrisy of the British colonization of India, which goes up to the systematic use of torture prohibited in the West, but outsourced to India. Really, nothing new under the sun. There were Guantanamos already in the midst of the 19th century British Empire. Uh, uh, the, a quote from Marx, the profound hypocrisy and inherent barbarism of bourgeois civilization lies unveiled before our eyes turning from its home where it assumes respectable forms to the colonies where it goes naked, end of quote. All that Marx adds is, quote, England has broken down the entire framework of Indian society without any symptoms of reconstitution yet appearing. This loss of its old world with no gain of a new one imparts a particular kind of melancholy to the present misery of the Hindu and separates Hindustan ruled by Britain from all its ancient traditions and from the whole of its past history. England, it is true, is causing a social revolution in Hindustan, a revolution which was actuated only by the vilest interests and was stupid in her manner of enforcing this interest. But, what is, but that is not the question. The question is, can mankind fulfill its destiny without a fundamental revolution in the social state of Asia? If not, whatever may have been the crime of England, she was, England was the unconscious tool of history in bringing about the revolution. Now, this is the Marx usually attacked. Uh, one should not dismiss here the talk of the unconscious tool of history. Marx is not a naive teleologist claiming, oh, the British brutal exploitation of India was a tool of some higher historical reason which made it an instrument of future progress and so on and so on. All Marx claims is that the British colonization of India unintendedly created conditions for the double liberation of India. 
from the constraints of its own traditions as well as from colonization itself. And there is even an empirical proof of this. Do you know that the British tried to, they were intelligent enough, the British colonizers, they knew that they, they, if they allow their colonization to simply dissolve traditional ideological social Indian edifice, castes, and so on, that this may create revolutionary upheavals in India. So it's interesting to notice how from the very beginning of their colonialist critics claim, uh, 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 British colonizers, col colonizers wanted to, to us to lose our tradition and to impose Western standards. No, on the contrary, they put hard work into re-establishing some kind of, re of resuscitating old, stable, value, ideological, religious systems which would keep India a stable, inert society ready to be exploited. For example, the ultimate Indian ideological textbook, The Loss of Manu, a pretty terrifying book, a detailed justification of caste system with detailed descriptions what, where to do. You know, I learned with surprise from my Indian friends that in 17th century at least, this book was half forgotten. It was just lost in different transcriptions. It is in the earlier 19th century that the British colonizers re-established, resuscitated this book. So I claim in this sense, uh, uh, all this topic about respect for local cultures and so on was from the very beginning the crucial part of the process of colonization. British didn't want to, for the Indians to become like them. They want them in their, in their inner traditional ways, and they even went as far as to praise immensely the superiority of their spirituality. The standard memoir of a British colonizer in India reads something like that. Yes, we may be richer materially, the British. Yes, we bring progress and industry to India. But when you see a simple yogi, saint praising there, don't you feel how worthless we are? Don't you feel the infinite depth, depth of that, of that uh, simple spirituality and so on and so on? I claim that this is absolutely crucial. You take this false respect from the other, for the other from colonialism. You lose colonialism itself. What do we have to accept here? We have to accept that, a quote from another great dialectician, Richard Wagner, from his Parsifal, the wound is schließt, der Sperr nur der sie schluck. The wound can only be healed by the very spear that smote it. That is to say, we should insist on what Marx insists, on this radical, brutal, but radical ambiguity of colonization. That is to say, that it is the very power of social disintegration brought by, uh, unleashed by colonization. All traditional forms of identity, traditional ethical mores dissolve and so on, which at the same time opens up the space for liberation, also for anti-colonial liberation. What do we mean by this? Let me give you another example from India itself. When I was there two years ago, I got got into a heated debate with some Indian cultural theorists who complained about the fact that they, are, that they had to use English language for, as their expression. They claimed this is already a form of cultural colonization which censor, uh, censors our true identity. They claim, can you see how strong colonization is even now when we try to formulate our project of liberation from colonialism, we have to do it in the language of the colonizers. This was a quote from one of them. We have to speak in an imposed foreign language to express our innermost identity. And does this not put us in a position of radical alienation. Even our resistance to colonization has to be formulated in the language of the colonizer. My answer to this was, yes, but this imposition of English, a foreign language, created the very X, unknown quantity, which is oppressed by it. 
That is to say, and this was my message, and it's typical what happened to me. I was shocked. How? This message was received differently among my partners in debate there, but in strict correlation to the social status. The top Brahmin intellectuals shouted at me as colonizer, blah, blah. The Dalits, the untouchables, immediately accepted it. Namely, my message was, it's true. When you are forced to speak a foreign language, you feel deprived of the very core of your identity. But my thesis is here a much more radical one. It is that that which you feel deprived of is a specter engendered by this very colonial imposition of a foreign language. In other words, it's a very refined dialectical paradox. If some of you are philosophers, Hegel uses a wonderful term, der absolute Gegenstoss, the absolute recoil, counterpoint for this. How? The very loss in a properly dialectical notion of history, the very loss of something creates the lost dimension. We don't have a pre-colonial India and then brutal colonization, which makes the people aware what they lost, and then in anti-colonial struggle, they are trying to regain what they lost. No, the pre-colonial India is, was something totally different. It's irredeemably lost. Insofar as it's not lost, it precisely serves colonizers. This new dimension that you are craving for, for example, in the case of India, a new modern democratic India, the very program of decolonization is something engendered by colonization itself as a reaction to it. Another example to make this clear. You know, he is one of my heroes, Malcolm X, the great American, a little bit more violent than uh, Martin Luther King, fighter for black rights. You know why he has chosen this no family name, but just X. X, unknown quantity, instead of, I don't know what, uh, family name. Of course, at an immediate level, he wanted to emphasize how the blacks, by being torn out of their uh, African ancestral homes, homes, that they are deprived of their roots. But the program of Malcolm X was not, so let's return to those roots. But X means what if we grasp this very void into which our enslavement put us, the fact that we don't have any genuine tradition to rely on, that we have to, as it were, collectively reinvent our identity as a unique opportunity of, pre of, of freedom. And it's also clear that he followed this line. At the end, we may debate it if he was right, he found the new universalist frame in Islam. He became Muslim. So he had no dreams about returning to origins. If you want further proofs of what I'm saying, never forget in South Africa that it was the greatness of African National Congress that they absolutely resisted all the bullshit about returning to some authentic African roots. The one who was preaching return to African roots was King Butelezi, a local king there, who, as we all know, was collaborating with apartheid forces. He was even directly financed by the Pretoria apartheid government. No, to see the truth of what I'm saying, you should really read history. For example, you should read the apartheid, white racist uh, justification of, well, apartheid system. It was not, we whites are more. Of course, it was this de facto, but the justification was something like, what a precious difference of cultures we have here. We have Bushman, Hottentot, this, that. If we allow them, if we give them equality in the modern sense, all these pressures, spiritual traditions, all we get lost in our vulgar, western, mechanical, imperialist, non-holistic, whatever civilization. It was, the idea was strictly, of course, a fake multiculturalism, but nonetheless a multiculturalism. And again, the greatness of Mandela and so on was always to insist. No, we should beat the white people at their own field by being more universal than they are. And so, again, 
back to uh, sorry, where are we? Yes, uh, back to uh, uh, back to India. I think that the solution is not to look for some lost British identity, but it's a crazy paradoxical solution, but accepted by Dalits and so on, to see decolonization as a welcome chance of getting rid of old rules and to take the fact that India is lacking, now is being deprived of their proper tradition again, as a chance of achieving a much more open, egalitarian, democratic society. And believe me or not, Western conservatives are becoming aware of it. For example, I read a wonderful complaint by an American conservative linguist who says, we shouldn't be too glad about the primacy of English language because he says, and he was right, that the language, the, the English language, which is now becoming lingua franca, is no longer the old English of true British people, but if it's an English sp spoken by, by Indian merchants in Bombay, by Singapore bankers, and so on and so on. The English itself as universal language is being stolen from British people themselves. So again, this is what I see as the core of Marxist insight. I don't believe in anti-colonial resistance on behalf of any return to some primordial lost roots and so on and so on. If anything, we should advocate an even further universalization, further loss of our local or whatever roots. Next point, and now I'm approaching the end, I want to make very briefly is that what does this mean again for us concretely today? There is a certain, how should I call it, paradigm which unites many modern or not so modern philosophers. Let's call it Hölderlin paradigm. By Hölderlin, I mean Friedrich Hölderlin, the great German poet whose best known hit line, as you know, is Wo das Gefahr ist, wächst das Rettende auch. Where the danger is, grows also what can save us. The idea is that our epoch is the epoch of extreme danger, extreme alienation for Marx or loss of our roots in global technology for Heidegger, but that this point of extreme loss is also the opportunity for what Heidegger calls the care, for the reversal. You know, when things are lost, there is a chance of reversal. For example, the whole eschatology of Marx is based on this. Capitalism is utter alienation. Workers are totally deprived of all of the substantial objective conditions of their work. But this very deprivation liberates them from all particular roots, creates them as universal subject who may reappropriate the universal substance. The next, my final thesis is that uh, I think we should resist this paradigm of we are at the moment of Kairos, you know, dangerous time, the very limit, everything is almost lost, but maybe there is a chance in this total enslavement for total liberation, whatever. I think on the opposite, that Hegel, we are, our situation is much clo closer to that experienced by Hegel. We had a revolution. For Hegel, it was the French Revolution. For us, the communist attempts of the 20th century and other attempts. And it's obvious, although Hegel's critique of French Revolution is a complex matter, but it's obvious that things went terribly wrong in Stalinism and so on, or for Hegel in the French Revolutionary Terror and so on. And the whole problem of Hegel, if we read him properly, is how in these conditions of failure, when, for example, communism, the way we experienced it in the 20th century, uh, was a fiasco globally, more or less, not totally, but nonetheless, how to save the legacy, how to remain faithful to it, how to do it again, how precisely not to betray what was worth fighting in it. Because uh, the fiasco of communism was used not only by anti-communists, but in a much wider sense 
by ruling ideology to put in question basically the entire legacy of modernity. You know, first it began with communism is over. It was a dangerous utopia. Then, as you probably know, it went on into, because of this lucky or unlucky coincidence, 1789, 1989, 200 years, that an era which began with the French Revolution is over with, in 1789, this egalitarian modern era. Then you can go further, modernity, all modernity was a fiasco. No wonder that, and you can feel this even in TV series, Game of Thrones or all this desire for a new neo-Gothic universe, that uh, there is a big unease with modernity. And you find here strange, bad, strange bedfellows from extreme right, which basically claims that it all began with Luther or European modernity, all horrors began there, up to a person for whom I have a great admiration, for example, uh, uh, Evo Morales, president of Bolivia, who said capitalism killed Mother Nature, as if the catastrophe started there. No, it didn't. I think that more than ever today, when we are faced with all horrors of global capitalism and so on and so on, more than ever, I claim, we should remain faithful to this Marxist insight that moder modernization is a radically ambiguous process and that every, any return to pre-modern values, traditions, only serves to accelerate to strengthen what is most dangerous in modernization, that the only way out is through bringing uh, modernization to its end. And now to conclude, really, this brings me back to the beginning. We encounter here the very dilemma with which I began, the two ways, either this holistic, pseudo-oriental, because with Buddhism things are much more complex, but I will not go into it now. This, uh, idea of holistic, global harmony, universal compassion, which will close the wound of modernity, or to accept that the only, the wound itself, by wound I mean this cut of modernity, violent interruption of traditional order by modern universalism, beginning with Christianity and so on, or that this is our only salvation. Since there were no dirty jokes, I would nonetheless like to begin with a or to end with a very dirty joke that I heard, believe it or not, in Ramallah from a Palestinian Christian. They are wonderful people, sense of humor. He told me this joke about Jesus Christ. The night before Jesus was arrest arrested and crucified, he was there praying alone in the tent. Jesus Christ, his followers, apostles, gathered around the tent and started to worry, like, Christ was still a virgin. He didn't have sex. And they say, my God, our Lord did so much to us, so many great things, and he will die tomorrow being crucified without any joy and happiness. So why don't we make at least the last evening of Jesus Christ, why don't we bring some joy to him? So they call Mary Magdalene and ask her to go to the tent where Christ is resting and to seduce him. Of course, being who she was, Mary said, oh, oh, with pleasure, and went there. Now, after five minutes, Mary Magdalene came out running with a totally horrified cry. And apostles were wondering, what happened there, my God? Is Christ secretly a pervert? That we did, did he torture her or what? No, no, she explains. I slowly, everything went well at the beginning. I slowly undressed, I spread my legs, I showed to Christ my pussy, but then catastrophe started. He said, what a terrible wound is there. He put his hand of in and healed it, made it whole, no? <laughs> I am, uh, so beware of the people too intent on healing other people's wounds. I claim in exactly the same way, if today's advocates of anti-Eurocentrism were to find themselves in actual pre-colonial reality, they would have undoubtedly uttered the same terrific scream as Mary Magdalene did. 
There is no way back. We have to play to the end the game of, or whatever we call it, of modernist project. I think this is the greatest temptation today, precisely, even if it's called anti-imperialism. I am totally against imperialism. I just think we should never, never forget that anti-imperialism is also a very much misused word. Remember that when they started to fight the British and so on, Germans and Japanese fascists were regularly using the term anti-imperialism and so on and so on. You know, I'm against anti-imperialism, I'm against imperialism, but I am not ready to sacrifice the legacy of European modernity. Precisely that passionate model of love, agape, universal love, love which is not the wisdom of keeping a distance, but fully falling into it, full, full engagement, losing oneself without reserve. For me, wisdom is not all that Star Wars pseudo-oriental bullshit, you know. Don't attach yourself too much to worldly object. No, attach yourself to the end to worldly object. That's the only way out for me, with all the risks this involves. Thank you very much. Thanks, Slavoj. What can I say after the joke with, Magdal joke with Magdalena? Uh, we have, I think, enough uh, time. You deserve it because the talk was boring. There is a better one also told to me, but this one is not obscene, it's very loving. If you want to understand what is identification in psychoanalysis, identification as basic alienation, you always identify with a decentered point. It's another story about Christ, the idea is when he was tired from all his work of religious blah, blah stuff, Jesus Christ said, I need a holiday. So he took one of the apostles and went to play golf on Galilee Sea there. So, okay, he was not a good golf player, so when he hit the ball, the ball fell into the sea. Not a problem of Christ, you know, he knows how to walk on water. So he went there, walked, looked down, ah, picked up the ball, went back, came back and then the apostle told Christ, but uh, listen, this is simply too difficult a hit for you. You know, you cannot do it. Even, even uh, who is the big guy? Uh, Tiger, Tiger, uh, Tiger Woods. Even Tiger Woods couldn't have done it. Christ says, wait a minute, Tiger Woods is an ordinary black guy. I'm a god. Uh, I can at least do what Tiger Woods can. And he tries again. But he misses again. And again goes to walk on the water. At that point, and I like this historical nonsense, I mean, at that point, a group of American tourists comes by <laughs> on a tour there, <laughs> step out of, and look at it. And one of them, looking, goes to Apostle and says, who is that idiot walking on the water there? What does he think? Who does he think he is? Jesus Christ? Apostle says, no words. He thinks he is Tiger Woods. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so you see, even God needs a foreign identification like that. Even Christ needs title. <laughs> Questions? Okay, there is a first question there already. The question is pretty short and simple. Yesterday you said that you do not want to be mobilized politically longer than two months in order to, I don't know, be able to do your philosophy. Are you ready to be in love longer than two months? It's a really good question. That's a good mid question. If we were to live in a real democratic socialist Stalinist society, this would be the last question you would ask. And tomorrow, the question would have been who was the last one to see you alive? <laughs> oh, quite seriously. Uh, let me answer like this uh, In matters of love, it may sound stupid and shocking, but yes, I'm extremely, I know it's difficult. But miracles do happen. By miracle, I mean love which lasts for life. For example, there was a French ecologist, social theorist, whom we know. I'm sure that if he were to 
be still alive, who would be here with us today? How do you pronounce? Andre, Andre Gortz. You know, he wrote, a, I forgot the title, A Wonderful. Yeah, is it translated? Uh, yeah. No, it's in English, right? Yeah, it's an incredible book. When he was a young guy, immediately after the war, he fell passionately in love. He was Austrian Jew living in France with a British girl who was also in France. And for 58 years, they were absolutely in love. And at the end, when she was dying of cancer, when she was approaching the end, he killed herself with her together. It's an incredibly touching, simple story. I'm not saying this happens regularly, but the miracle of love happens. And I think even that I'm absolutely not saying anything conservative here. I'm saying something very even leftist revolutionary. It's on the contrary, as I hinted at the beginning, the mass media propaganda who try to convince us, you know, everything is changing, you have to experience life. No, I don't. When I find the right woman, the right person, I don't want to experience too much other life. But about, so I, I think simply that this is the difference. I am opposed to that cheap Freudomarxism from my youth, where the idea is that sexual is political in the immediate sense. Revolution should be a big fuck and, you know, like, and so on. And if you are in love with one woman, it's the elementary form of bourgeois individualism, whatever, and so on and so on. No, uh, as to, uh, so, as to p politics, first, I wouldn't say that what I was targeting at, when I said I don't want to be more than two, for more than two weeks uh, politically engaged fully, that I didn't target agape love. What I target is this, a certain dismissal of ordinary people that I find here. I spoke with many uh, leftists, sincere leftists who said, look how easily people are corrupted. You uh, you offer them something, after two, three months, they get tired of mobilization. But wait a minute, can we even... I found nothing dismissive or cheap or corruptive in the fact that an ordinary person wants his peaceful, decent life and so on and so on. I'm not ready to betray this as some form of alienation or whatever. That was only my point. That not that nothing can be changed at that everyday level, but that on the contrary, the only changes which truly count are those changes at the very everyday level. They are the most difficult changes. There, and this also confirms my other point, that today, maybe we no longer live in an ideological era in a big sense, like projects to die for. But, you know, true ideology is in everyday life what you buy, how you consume, what you desire, and so on. There, a change there. This is what uh, Alexis, who is now back in Greece, no, was telling us before when he says that what is happening now in Greece, it's not just a political change. It's something, it is something at the level of everyday ethics that is changing. So, to answer briefly and unambiguously to your question, I think that here, precisely, we get a difference between erotic love passion and political passion. Political passion is temporary limited. Erotic, if it's authentic, it's not. I'm here absolutely romantic. I think that even if it doesn't actually last forever, I still am for divorce and so on, myself having some practice in it. <laughs> but even if it doesn't last, when you engage, it should be, how should I put it, within the prospect of eternity. When you are authentic, you cannot be authentically in love and already counting, let's say that now, haha, we, we are, are you are in love. <laughs> and that you know, like, do you think, shall we say two months, three months, then we will have to rethink it or what? It's over. Even if it's an illusion, it's a structural illusion, it must be the prospect of eternity. So I have a question. Uh, you obviously divorced several times. Why do you marry again and again? Uh, you will I will end up in Gulag, I know. <laughs> you will disappear much faster than here. <laughs> no? uh, 
Uh, uh, uh, no, I mean, we remember uh, uh, the old... How, uh, don't you have that point in American constitution that those who were accused of being communists in the witch country, that the Fifth Amendment, no? I refuse to answer this question because the answer may incriminate me, no? <laughs> Something along these lines. Okay, give us some political questions then. You ra there is a question, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I am trying to make uh, some sense out of all of this mess I've just heard, but trying to connect the beginning and the end. Uh, is it possible that communism as such failed because it was mostly tried in uh, countries that were basically uh, Christian and with our understanding of love as it is kind of selfish, this is what exactly in, one, in some sense prevented the countries that tried communism to truly achieve it. As long as we you know, love one another instead of of everyone, which should be as it is on the paper, but in reality it's not. Does, does uh, this religious understanding of love prevent true communism from happening ever on planet Earth? Nice question. I like this question. <laughs> no, seriously. You know, in what precise sense? But nonetheless, I'm not sure that I agree with it. First, I wouldn't, you know, it's very dangerous when we are talking about the causes of the obvious, at least general, I wouldn't say it was on all levels a total failure, but generally the failure of 20th century communism. You know, uh, it's a very dangerous game to engage in this cultural thinking because it was too Western, too Eastern. And I got this lesson wonderfully when I visited Russia. Uh, uh, you know that European communists, even we, ex-Yugoslav communists, like to play this game. Ah, you know, Stalinism was there because, you know, Russia is half Asiatic, uh, Oriental, barbarian tradition, so revolution happened in a stupid, despotic Asiatic country, so that's why there was Stalinism, which is absolutely not true. You can prove how all the elements can indeed emerge also in the worst of the same logic. But what surprised me in Russia was that when I, uh, visit, when I visited then some conservatives, they told me the exactly opposite story. Russia was good, authoritarian, but tolerant, organic, and then all the evil comes from the West, from violent Western modernizers. They draw a line from a little bit, even the terrible, but then especially Peter the Great up to Stalin. So for them, communism was a Western rationalist, whatever, brutal imposition on. So you know, these games are dangerous, even when you say West, but wait a minute, in China, uh, I don't think you exactly can call Mao a great, uh, a great uh, 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 Christian. But nonetheless, if you look at the victims of not so much cultural revolution, I concede that there was an untenting aspect in cultural revolution. But for example, the great leap forward of the late 50s, which was a brutal event beyond imagination. Now even the Chinese Communist Party itself is carefully releasing figures, and the sad thing is that the figures are higher than those estimated by harshest dissident critics of communism. Dissident critics claim that 30, 35 millions probably died in from uh, 58, 9 till 61, the hunger following the great leap forward. Now the official numbers are definitely over 50 millions who died. So, you know, like, uh, I wouldn't play this game. What I would nonetheless, uh, because, you know, that was also not that I blame Buddhism, the point of my uh, negative, only here, otherwise it's more complex, reference to Buddhism. You know, I don't see here any specific, I totally reject this idea that our Christianity has a more totalitarian character and so on, while Buddhism is more holistic, peaceful. Oh, no, no, you find extremely brutal regimes justified in Buddhist uh, terminology also. As to universal love, now you touch the crucial point. I don't have time to go into it. I would say that for me, an authentic communist perspective would not be love for humanity. Here I admire Marx, you know, when they were debating uh, 
for uh, uh, when Marx was writing with Engels Communist Manifesto and they were debating what should be the slogan with their fellows. And some of them proposed things like all men are brothers, love of mankind, and Marx just acidly answered, no thanks, there are quite many people whom I don't want to be my brothers and <laughs> quite many people I don't want to love and so on. So I think, I think that it's always something wrong in proclaiming directly universal love in this simple, all-encompassing sense. Because I think that this type of love is always found, founded on an exception. I love you all, always when you scratch deep enough, means something like I love you all and I love you all so much that I'm ready to kill all those who destroy, who undermine your, uni your uh, universal welfare. For me, the ultimate example of this universal love is, do you remember the single most sublime scene for me from disintegration of communism in 89? In East Germany, the DDR, you remember when the system was falling apart, there was one of the last sessions of the official still communist, I think Volkskammer People's Assembly, where he was already being attacked, but he tried to defend himself who he, Erich Milke, the ultimate, the boss of Stasi, organizer of state terror and so on. And then when people started to shout at him, look on YouTube, you find everywhere this clip. He looked surprised when people started to mock him, he said, aber ich liebe euch alle, but I love you all. I don't think this was hypocrisy. I mean, uh, terror is for me always grounded in a false universal love. I think that authentic love is always, the majority of the people are stupid idiots, I'm ignorant, but ah, 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 maybe I love you, on you, on you, just you. I much more believe in this particular exclusive love. Now you will say, what about agape that I was saying about? This is for me strictly love as a category of struggle. It's not love in the sense of I love you all. It's the sense of let's establish solidarity. The only universality that I admit today is the universality of struggle. Which is why I hate this UNESCO idea, don't all human cultures have something in common? Then you end up with those absolutely boring UNESCO world reports, this culture is nice, that culture is nice. No, I think on the contrary, the only universality is we have here our problems. In Egypt they have problems, in United, is there a common front of each of us, of each of us fighting in our country against an enemy. That's love. That's love as a category of struggle, absolutely. Uh, Janis Varoufakis has a question. Ah, can I just add Finally. something very briefly? To avoid the ah, that, the that, no, 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 no. That I'm not advocating with, when I spoke about terror, physical violence. On the contrary, I think it can be nicely proven how all brutal, violence done in the 20th century was, on the contrary, a sign of impotence only. This is what brought me so much trouble in the United States when I said to provoke people, the problem with Hitler was that he wasn't violent enough. <laughs> that is to say, he killed millions, but why? Because he was afraid to really change social relations. His violence was not a heroic violence. Hitler's violence was, in Nietzsche's terms, a reactive violence a protective violence. Even with Stalin, his single most violent act, probably, the forced collectivization in the late 20s, it was a clear act of despair in the sense of the violence unleashed there was an enactment of the utter failure to find a solution to how to include farmers into the process of socialism. It was just and so, you see my point. I think that brutal, direct, physical violence is, as a rule, a sign of impotence. When you are really strong, you don't need physical violence. I thought you wanted to avoid Yanis Varoufakis' question, but <laughs> you won't. Please. Slavoj, a, a most wonderful representation of the wondrous discontinuity which 
the act of falling in love is. But let me add, juxtapose it against another discontinuity, suicide, which is also a major break with the self. And I'm mentioning that in the context of your quotation from The Spectator. Because as we speak, Foxconn, which produces our iPhones, has electrified the roof because of 720 suicides that happened by Chinese workers jumping off. At the same time, we know that in India, the number of farmers that have committed suicide, victims of genetically modified experiments with their crops by Monsanto and the rest. Uh, and these suicides, both in Foxconn and in India, which I'm just using paradigmatically here, uh, go completely hand in hand with spectacular economic growth because the farming communities that use these GM crops, statistically speaking, are booming, and so is Foxconn. And despite the fact that workers in Foxconn worked for 12 hours in Dickensian conditions, conditions that Engels described so well about Manchester in the conditions of the English working class, that in macroeconomic statistics that the spectator takes proper, uh, seriously, represents the golden age that that article mentions. But we need to stiffen our lip. Besides saying what Engels was saying and what Marx was saying, that the industrial revolution and capitalism is wonderfully ambiguous in that it simultaneously and dialectically generates immense unprecedented wealth and unheard of de depravity and deprivation. Despite that, you are quite right to insist, and we are quite right to insist, that this is nevertheless a crisis of capitalism, even measured by GDP standards. Because let's say, you mentioned the BRICS, which they celebrate in The Spectator and The Economist and so on. None of these countries are self-sustaining. All of them are net exporters, depending on the capacity of the Atlanticist states, on the one hand, the United States, on the other, Europe, to absorb those uh, net exports. Neither Brazil nor China can maintain that growth. They are, in, this, in a sense, completely embroiled in the capitalist uh, crisis which unfo is unfolding in Europe and, and America. So we have a growth which is utterly um, corrupted by massive rises in human pain, and at the same time we have a growth which is not even sustaining in its own, by, by its own criteria. So you, you need to stiffen your lip a bit. Let me emphasize this, that I totally agree with you. Let me begin with things that you said about Foxconn, because I already wrote about it, I even didn't know about this detail, but already what I knew about, what I knew long ago about, okay, two years about Foxconn, it's wonderful, wonderful in the terrifying sense. For example, do you know, I read in a report given to me by a Chinese friend, do you know that as a reaction to this suicide, Foxconn, it's a wonderful measure that Michel Foucault would have loved as biopolitics, moralization, that Foxconn now makes their employees, it's the condition of getting employed there, sign an anti-suicide pact, where you promise that you will not kill yourself, okay, that's ridiculous, but now comes the better part, and you must oblige yourself that if you see any of your neighbors, colleagues at work in a too depressed mood, that you will quickly report him. That's the other thing is that this electrification that you mentioned is a further step from what I heard a year or two ago, and I love this, is that since these buildings they are putting together, iPads, blah, blah, are multi-store buildings, and they were jumping from up, that they were placing around the windows large networks, you know. That's what I call capitalism with a human face, you know. So that if you jump down, you will not die, you get caught in a network. And, but do you know then the most obscene thing which caused scandal even in China is that the boss of network visited somewhere, was it Shanghai or Taipei, I don't know where, uh, one of the big zoos, zoological gardens there, and in an extremely open, tasteless way, he directly commented at it, 
I have to organize the cohabitation in my factory of so many living beings, animals, that I would like a lesson from a zoo park, how you get this, and so on and so on. But, uh, so I totally agree with you. I also absolutely agree with your second point, which is that, uh, uh, of course, there is a growing crisis, and it's a structural crisis. Uh, I'm trying to read economists, you, Z Lazarato, my American friends, to understand what it is about, but I, I, absolutely, I absolutely agree with you. I simply think that it's a dream, and it's the most dangerous utopia that we have, have today. It's a dream that if we somehow, how should I put it, just concentrate and don't do too much and just ameliorate things here and there, then somehow we will manage and the world, the way it is, will survive. No, I think we already are in an incredible social, social change of deteriorating uh, ethical standards, political standards, and so on and so on. For example, what I always like to mention, uh, are we aware what kind of ethical counter-revolution this is that all of a sudden now, in a silent way, although there are some resistance, torture is, of political pri of, uh, prisoners is silently, it silently became publicly acceptable, and so on and so on. So no, I think that it's not just that the system is going on. Uh, things are changing. Things are changing. We are in the middle of the change, and as with all great changes, we are not even aware how things are changing. The only thing I maybe didn't quite get is uh, what do you mean by that uh, Stephen Lips? I agree with you. It's this terrifying impact and so on and so on. But okay, I'm then just, if you can shout back at me quickly, can you, you just an answer? But then do you, I, where? I stand is that I'm again fully aware of all of this, but I sincerely don't believe that any reference to or reliance on some pre-modern forms of uh, solidarity will help. That's what the Chinese are precisely trying to do it. I spoke in China with their low level, I admit, functionaries, and they told me that's the basis of their, you know, support for religion, don't be deceived by that anti-Buddhist campaigns and so on. This is only when religion is politicized, but basically, Chinese government is spending billions on religion, because they are fully aware that with this violent destabilization, social disintegration, and they are at the same time aware that communist ideology can no longer seriously provide social homogeneity, so they play either with uh, patriotism, a kind of Confucian patriotism, or directly with religion. I think they are absolutely sincere in their appraisal of religion. All I'm saying is that I don't believe in this option, because it's, for me, at its most elementary, a fascist option. This is fascism. We can get modernization if we stabilize it with some forms of ancient hierarchy and so on and so on. That's the only thing on which I would insist, as it were, that there is nonetheless no way back. But the irony of what you said, I'm fully aware of. Even do you know that the, this is the most brutal sad thing, the greatest number of farmers' suicides in India are in, how is called the area, it's Bengali, around Calcutta or Kolkata, West Bengal, I think. No, East, whatever, okay, there, where the irony is that for 30 years or more, local communist power, communists were in power there. And they did a very successful thing, I was told. They distributed land to small farmers and West Bengal, for a long time importer of food within India, started to export food. Now, and that's the sad thing, it's the communists in power who became these global market modernizers, claiming, oh, it's no longer good enough, small, fa we have to modernize, and again, they triggered, I think it's in the tens of thousands, farmers, head of families, 
who cannot take of their family and simply uh, kill themselves. And we have to be very careful here about what we read in our media. For example, you remember it was reported all around our media uh, a cu this couple of gang rapes. You know, a girl, I don't know where, uh, raped with five men in a bus and the whole. Yeah, but my friend from India, Arundhati uh, Roy, the writer, wrote a wonderful comment where she pointed out why was there such a universal outcry? Because the five rapists were poor, poor, lower class people. She wrote, if you are really horrified by it, my God, go to Bombay and look at the totally tolerated by those in power uh, structure of their uh, whorehouses, prostitution houses. It's a complicated network where regularly agents are sent to poor parts of India or Nepal, buying girls aged from five, six years already, who are simply sold by poor farmers and then they are either immediately used in uh, uh, bordelos or even worse, kept as slaves reserved for rich customers and so on and so on. You know, when you have all that horror there and everyone knows it, it is a little bit hypocritical to focus so much on that rape. I mean, if you really s worry about suffering of sexually abused women, just go to Bombay and look around a little bit in those. Well, since you asked, I'll just tell you very quickly. Yeah. Um, when I said stiffen your, li stiffen your lip, what I meant was, when we read articles like that from The Spectator, what we should say is, yes, you have a plethora of small truths on which, however, you are building a scandalous lie, lie just like Joseph Goebbels has taught you. I totally agree here with you. And, uh, there are, okay, sorry. Uh, no, no. Uh, here, here, I totally agree with you. And this is a nice example of how ideology functions today, you know. It's in the selection, you, you, don't even, you don't even have to tell the truth and so on. And I think when you used Goebbels here, you used a wonderful example. Because, you know, I like to say this to shock my friends. For example, when you debate with a Nazi who is ferociously anti-Semitic, the Jews. You should never limit debate simply just to facts. Facts can be manipulated. For example, if a Nazi from late 30s in Germany tells you uh, Jews are seducing our German girls, well, of course, probably, and I hope they did, some of them did it and so on. It's at least partially true. If they say Jews are exploiting German workers, where not all, but some of the Jews were rich and so on and so on. So you see, the point is not this. The moment you accept the debate at this point, you know, you are, you are, you are lost. So, uh, but still, uh, you know what's the problem for me of the left? It is nonetheless, and I ask you now, as an economist and so on, like, what, it's a stupid question, and it's the one million dollar question, as in a TV show, because all of us are, where in what do you see the solution? In a more socially controlled neo keynesian capitalism, in this, in this, can you give us a general sense of orientation? Yeah, please give me. Yeah, but in like five, ten seconds. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, in two sentences. Yeah. We need a Keynesian st stabilization just because the free fall is not revolutionary and it only helps the Nazis. The second question, once stabilization is achieved, that buys us breathing ground in order to dream dangerously about the good society. There was another question here, yeah. Thank you. I'll uh, change the topic back to uh, love. And, um, and while, while you were speaking, I was uh, thinking of a, a movie that brings up this uh, love as a political category. I don't know if you have seen it, this uh, Life of Others, which I think it's a rather uh, stupid movie about this uh, police officer, a secret I know, police I know, officer. I know, I know. Oh, you, you know, okay. So you know that there is this uh, uh, particular uh, transformation of the secret police officer when yes. he 
uh, watches the couple being uh, completely in love, making passionate yeah. love and so on and so forth. <laughs> so basically the m message is that, okay, once you are exposed, even as an evil secret police officer, once you're exposed to this beautiful uh, miracle of love, you uh, transform yourself and you basically break with your institution and everyday life um, mm -hmm. uh, rules and you uh, turn good. And I was wondering, to what extent or where do you dra draw the line with your own theory of uh, love see. from this bourgeois or if you want modern, modern bourgeois category of love, which is in itself also sort of, you know, claiming universal and claiming this particular break with the mundane reality. Yeah. So what is the particular gap that nice you... Nice question. First, I would say the Stasi officer, he doesn't fall in love. He falls with a certain... He's an observer. But uh, now... If you permit me, we all know what we are talking about. Leben der Arne, Lies of Others, the well-known German film, blah, blah, God, the Oscar, and so on. I think this is, I am also like you, totally opposed to this film. The first, my first reading is that it's almost a modern version of Casablanca. A beneath official topic of heterosexual love, it's clearly the final line of the feeling could have been, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship between the writer and the Stasi agent, and clearly the woman has to be sacrificed. <laughs> like, we get rid of the woman, the true couple is created. Second thing, the movie, that's the paradox. Although the author is ferociously anti-communist, and a friend of mine in Germany who knows the director even explained to me why. He comes with this complicated von Donner schmack, I don't know what. He comes from East Prussian family, which never forgave the Soviets to take their castle from them. No? So this film is a personal revenge. But the irony is that the movie is not harsh enough against the horror of police rule. You know why not? What's the hypothesis of the woman? You know the story. A young, young, not a young, successful writer with a beautiful woman, some high, pol some high political minister, even whatever, functionary, falls in love with the woman, and he orders secret police to cover the husband totally, to discover something, so that he will get rid of the husband to have the woman. What a terrible mis... What a terrible falsification. The whole... Listen, what happens in this film could have happened in any society. If you are... If you have a relatively powerful position, a CIA agent can do this, a top executive... Uh, that is to say, the liberal limit of the film is that it locates evil in one of these private vices. You want money, you want sex, whatever, you do something criminal. But the true horror of Stasi in DDR was the following one. Imagine that there is no wicked minister who wanted, if you are the writer, sorry to be personal. Imagine there is no secret, there is no high nomenclatura guy who wants to fuck your wife. There are only, under quotation marks, good policemen, like the hero, and you would still be under observation. You know, instead of showing how total control was part of the... Imagine a writer like the hero of the film, whose plays are performed in the West and so on. It's unimaginable in dead air that such a person, irrespective of who wants to fuck his wife, would not be under permanent observation. And again, so you see the paradox. This film uh, paints the portrait of horror of dead air. It's much too, it's much too modest, it, which is why, although it's a little bit kitschy, I prefer the other film, Goodbye Lenin. Why? Because the, the fundamental premise embodied in the fate of the mother of that film is that the only way to, to survive if you are an honest communist is that you go crazy, to put it bluntly, no? It's a, you know, but it's not just Ostalgi as they criticized it. And, but you know, did you see the third film by, I forgot the director, Barbara? It's a third, a newer film about an East German uh, 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 women doctor being displaced onto some Baltic Sea resort, falling in love with a local guy who is, has to report on her, but is also have this event. This is also definitely better film than, than Leben der Anderen, no? I think that was hopefully for us uh, one, how do you call it, 
one hit wonder of that guy. Didn't he do that phone, whatever, the Prussian cast loner? Didn't he do some horrible film with Angelina Jolie and Johnny Depp? Sorry? Yeah, didn't he do that one? And it's horrible, so we are rid of that guy. <laughs> Uh, so there is another question, yeah. Uh, hello, uh, I want to ask you about, uh, imagine that everything goes like you say, like the perfect love, the perfect uh, world, the perfect earth, the perfect everything. And what happened next when uh, we are uh, living each other's and appears our real nature? A real a real nature is like everybody can be an assassin, you know? It's like everybody can be like a murderer. You must just push a button. And our nature is like we are uh, natural born killers. I wouldn't be, no, I'm not ideal. I'm first, glad the director of the natural born yeah, killers yeah. is here. <laughs> yeah. No, first I would have said that, uh, you know, I have no great belief in what you call human nature. I always oppose this spontaneous communist idea that if you are for new, more solidary uh, society, that you must somehow believe in essential goodness of humans and so on. No, I tend to agree spontaneously, like many intelligent Marxists, like look at Bertolt Brecht. He said in a wonderful short text that Humans are by nature evil. You cannot change humans. You can only change conditions to take from the people the possibility to actualize their evil or whatever. But on the other hand, you know, things are a little bit more complicated. When you say we are all natural born, born killers, I wouldn't put it like this. I would put it like we have maybe a certain propensity for violence, for acting out, which can be put to many different uses. It can be turned into, you know what I mean? The problem, I don't see a great, I don't see a great problem here. I, I think, you know, it's the same problem as, for example, if you talk with intelligent uh, 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 geneticists, biologists, and they tell you, all of them who are real, professional scientists. And they tell me, forget about all that bullshit. We discovered a gene for homosexuality, for jealousy, for religion. It's all bullshit. These are very vague tendencies and it turns on the combination with other genes, how they turn out. And it's the same, I think, with this human, human nature. I, I'm, I'm, I doubt that there are... I'm not saying I never, let me be clear in this way, when I talk about communism and so on, no, I, I'm not even saying there will be, if there will be a society which will overcome capitalism. I'm not even saying there will be more happiness there and so on or whatever, less suffering and so on and so on. I'm totally uh, the most brutal realist you can imagine here. On, on, on the top of it, I think, I, so I don't, be, I didn't use the word uh, ideal, I used the word miracle. I believe in miracles. I think life is shit, but I believe in a materialist way. Miracles happen, and that's for me the greatness of ethics. I knew people who were total shit, conformists and so on, and at some point they say, fuck it, I have it enough, I will not take this. And they become momentarily heroes. A great figure from history for this, Giordano Bruno. We only know about his, you know, how he was burned. But you know that till that final moment, he was just walking around, slandering, compromising, and so on. All of a sudden, you have the moment of a miracle. And I read a wonderful, similar story of a top German Nazi officer. He was not a mega anti-Semite, but he was a pretty nasty guy. He was helping, organizing Holocaust, blah, blah, blah. At a certain point in 43, something broke down in him. And he said, no, in a, I cannot go on with this anymore. And he risked his life to save uh, Jews and so on and so on. So no, I don't believe in any good human nature. I believe in miracles. I believe that while life is generally shit, Things happen here and there. You know, we all, I don't, you, we all cheat our wives, our husband, it's all bullshit. <laughs> Fuck it. Once here and there you find Andre Gortz. You know, yeah. 
And that's enough for me, almost. I'm very modest. I just need a miracle here and there. <laughs> Can we stop it slowly? One more. One more. Yeah. Since uh, our simultaneous translators are working all the day, and please a big applause for them as well. I know what they will be doing now. They will hate me so much for me talking fast that immediately they will go home or to a store, buy a voodoo doll of me, and they will be putting needles in, you know. To take, so that then I will awaken with pain as a revenge. And I understand you fully for doing it. But the question is, what did they do translate right now? I hope you did what I once saw when I was young, a wonderful documentary on, you remember if you are old enough, there was Duvalier dictatorship in Haiti, and then there was a baby Duvalier, the stupid son, big fat guy who was a dictator, and I saw, once I saw on TV a press conference with him, and a Western journalist asked him what's the economic situation in Haiti, and Duvalier just said, well, it's not too bad, and then the translator translated this, in view of the recent stock exchange trendings and that theory and so on. I hope you did the opposite, no? I go on for 10 minutes and you say, he's just bullshitting, he doesn't have a good answer. So one last question, who will it be? If there are no questions? pseudo-Buddhist or Heideggerian, if there are no questions, then you should listen to silence itself as the ultimate answer, you know, and clap with one hand to it, okay. Unfortunately, there is a question uh, without silence. There is one uh, brief question, I'll try to make it brief. Uh, it's about a book uh, written by a young uh, French historian and philosopher. I think her last name is Ducre. I bought that book uh, for my mom's birthday, so I haven't read all of it, but I read the main part. Anyway, uh, it's about, uh, the main part is about uh, Mussolini as such and uh, Hitler, which uh, really uh, made, her quite, made quite an impression on me. Uh, my point is, uh, they were, uh, major leaders, they were seen as uh, strong characters, Il Duce, Der Führer, and all that, whilst um, when we read uh, their letters to their mistresses, uh, they were quite fragile, very uh, instable, and uh, uh, even there's a letter uh, from Mussolini to one of his mistresses, where he says uh, that is so uh, miserable, poor, uh, that he doesn't know how to cope, uh, how to manage without her. And that's this uh, notion of love, and yet um, power, uh, which reflects this uh, lack of power, lack of power mm -hmm. in the Lacanian sense, we could say. And uh, uh, how, would you, um, how would you comment that? Uh, that a person is uh, on one side a great leader and on the other side a uh, very weak person and uh, has no friends, uh, has uh, numerous uh, mistresses and uh, so on. Uh, but um, he's a very, he's a person and has no uh, self confidence. But okay, on I, the I other side, a great leader. Oh, no. I yes. got it. Okay, I, can, I think I can give you a very brief and precise answer. What I don't believe in is that this intimate self-experience is some kind of a deeper truth about that person. I think that the truth is outside in what Mussolini was doing. And I think that this self-image of a vulnerable, fragile person is precisely the lie he invented for himself to be able to do the horrors he was doing publicly out there. I, and this goes generally, you know, I don't think that, because if you approach it in this way, it's not only Hitler and Mussolini, I'm absolutely sure that Stalin played and loved his daughter Svetlana and so on and so on. All dictators 
or generally men, the evil men, the more they are brutal, the more they need some private fetish when they can say, or for example, the in, in managers, sorry, in, with big bank managers and so on. I think that the same role is played by private donations and charities, you know. You are a manager, manager of a big bank, brutally destroying lives of 10,000. Then in the afternoon you say, but it's horrible what is happening in Somalia. Let me give 2% on my wealth to them. And you feel so good and you can tell yourself, you see, that's just business that I'm ruining hundreds of thousands. This is the true me. This fragile person who is ready to cry with you. This is it. So again, to put it very brutally, I think that we don't ju lie just to others. We lie especially to ourselves. And especially when we do horrible things, we need, as it were, a private myth. How we present ourselves to ourselves. My God, this is the, a dream of very great men who does horrible things. To present himself, but you see, if you were to see me alone, you would see that I'm also a modest person with all the weaknesses and so on and so on. Which is why I claim that maybe even the fundamental form of ideology today is, I'm not just embodiment of economic or ideological categories, I'm also a warm, fragile human person. That's the lie. And that's why I like Brecht, where in a brutal way, he doesn't allow for that. He precisely reduces capitalists or people to their social roles. Like the big rule of Brecht is, please don't come up with that bullshit. What a beautiful, deep, profound, careful person you are privately for yourself, and so on and so on. That's, that's for me not even something specifically communist. This is what I see even already the, lega the great legacy of Jewish ethics. It's a totally intersubjective ethics. It's not, oh no, no, wait a minute. I'm very critical of, wait a minute. I'm usually accused in Israel of up to preparing a new Holocaust and so on. <laughs> I'm part of the boycott there. So I'm not, uh, but my criticism of state of Israel is I think more intelligent. What I'm claiming is that the greatest threat to what was great in Jewish identity comes from the state of Israel the way it works now. If the tendency, if what they are doing now will go on, in one, two generations, Jews will be just another boring colonialist nation like all the other. All that was great in Jewish tradition, their implicit universality and so on will be lost. But what I want to say that the greatest of traditional Jewish ethics is the total externalization. Like the truth is not but how did, what did this, no, the truth is in how you interact with others, not in how did you experience it in your insight, what did it mean to your spiritual growth. I think that all these categories of authentic self-experience, inner spiritual growth and so on are bullshit. I believe in total externality. To give you another from my old books example, my favorite story about ethics is how it was told by an old black friend from me from South Africa. In the old days of apartheid, a policeman was, police was dispersing a black demonstration. And uh, one policeman was running after, and she was trying to escape him, a black lady. Probably middle class with high heel shoes and so on. Then something weird happened. Uh, trying to run away with high heel shoes, which doesn't work well, made the lady drop, she lost one shoe. And at that point, the policeman, and I must emphasize this, it's not that he was inherently a good person or what, but this totally superficial manners took over when you see a lady in distress and he stopped, took the shoe and gave it to her, here it is, lady. And then they looked at each other and they felt stupid, like now that she has the shoes on, what should you do? Okay, now we start running again. So embarrassed, he said, goodbye lady, and turned around and walked away. That's the morality I believe in. I'm not making the point, that's crucial, that this black policeman was deep in his heart a good person. No, deep in his heart he was probably a shitty racist and so on. But you know, superficial manners can do miracles. You do this ten times and maybe your 
deep, deep heart will change a little bit. This is, for me, the greatest case of Mark Twain, I think, in Huck Finn. There is a legendary scene where, uh, I think that Huck or Tom Sawyer, no, no, who, they help a runaway black slave, and then they feel morally bad for doing something. You know, how? What they did externally was right, but precisely their inner bad feeling is what is non-authentic. Like how they are not racist on the outside. On the outside, they did a different thing. On the inside, they are racist. Which is why, again, I believe in surfaces, in good manners, you know. I don't believe in, that's, I don't believe in, uh, I mean, uh, I don't believe in really loving others. I, I hate this idea of we should love other races, other nations. No, we should hate them. We should just learn to pretend to act as if we care for them and to be in this way to maintain appropriate distance and so on. I think that the most disgusting motto is this politically correct one, do we know others enough? We should get to know them. No, I, I think people are boring. I don't want to know too, too many things about them. It's quite enough to have a respectful distance. This idea, we should know the other. How can we know the other when the others don't know themselves? I mean, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I believe in superficial manners. I saw that the, the applause were not, was not to warrant it's okay. When we communists will take power, you will learn how to <laughs> Okay, a bigger applause, please. No, no. no. Our, man, our love is over. I divorced.